our last presenter for today is Jo Bedefoots. A lot of us know Jo already, but for those who don't, um, Jo is not only one of my great colleagues, he's also a civic engineer, a master in cognitive science, and a philosopher. He currently works at the University of Antwerp in the Department of Philosophy, where he's doing his PhD research in the context of the neuroepigenetics projects. And his focus there is um, Tourette syndrome. As someone with autism, you is also engaged in autism studies, of course, in LAVA and in the IAN network. Um, and his presentation for today titles Neurogradualism, Your Diversity Without categor Categorical Difference. Yo? Thank you, Lenny. Uh, so let's see whether this works. If all is well, my presentation and my voice are with you. Uh, I surely can too as well as the previous two presenters, but uh, I'll do my best not to make it too complex. Uh, so, as uh, Leni told you, I am, uh, uh, first of all, originally, I'm a civil engineer and uh, I did also cognitive science. So, actually, before uh, I was diagnosed with uh, autism, uh, I looked at it from, uh, let's say, more exact scientific, looked at matters at a more exact scientific uh, way. And uh, I think my presentation is in this sense, uh, say, a continuation of what uh, Jana and Robert have done, but with a very specific uh, question. Uh, how to marry, on the one hand, the neuro in neurodiversity, uh, the cognitive science, the brain sciences, the neurosciences view, and the diversity in this case, the human diversity aspect, which is the second part of uh, neurodiversity. And my question specifically is, can we do this without uh, necessarily uh, talking about uh, neurotypes or neurotypes? I'm not saying that that is bad talk, but for me, I want to uh, find a way also maybe given my personal history, uh, as I mentioned, a way of trying to bring this, bring the autistic and the typical closer together without abolishing the differences, but also without really making, as the uh, title of my talk says, making a very categorical uh, split. So what I'll do is, uh, I'll first of all, uh, go with you to something which actually was my experience on being diagnosed and that is what I call the catch-22 of autism and then I'll move and say what are uh, in line with uh, actually the third response of Robert uh, how can we view uh, autism and uh, dysfunction together without marrying them without pathologizing autism and then I'll go to embodiment themes, which Jana has uh, already uh, touched upon. And I'll try to uh, work towards a conclusion uh, where I think uh, some concept like neurogradualism is actually something which uh, emerges as a, uh, as a sympathetic uh, and empathic uh, solution. So first of all, uh, what is a catch-22? I think uh, a lot of people will know this, uh, but this is a reminder of uh, the person who coined uh, the term, uh, Joseph Heller. And you can read uh, the quote, but the catch-22, as is clear in the quote, is something where uh, either you do it and then you're uh, out of luck, or you don't and you're also uh, out of luck. And I think this is something which uh, is uh, at least close to uh, what was my experience when I was diagnosed and when I encountered uh, neurodiversity. That on the one hand, uh, you have a lot of people until very recently, uh, and still now, I think maybe in the public opinion, talking very negatively about autism as a disorder, as something to be cured, something to be avoided, something to, let's say, be treated such that there is a positive outcome, that positive outcome be not being, not being autistic. And on the other hand, uh, the 
luckily, emerging uh, view of autism uh, as a positive identity. And I took some things uh, here from uh, the internet, but there is also work here, I quote Jarsma and Willen, but also work by Robert, by Damien Milton, and so on and so forth, where we really all try to convey that there is something positive uh, to being uh, autistic. So this is part of the catch-22, as we will see uh, later. Another thing, more from a, a scientific angle, is that uh, on the left hand you have uh, uh, one of the books uh, of, Saturn, uh, of Simon Baron Cohen, looking at a very exact scientific. So when Robert said science, a lot of people think science is purely exact science. And if you look at it from a really new neuroscientific angle, a lot of people want to pin it down as something which is, like in the theory of mind case, something which is missing, a deficit. On the other hand, you have human sciences, and I've taken a book by Anne McGuire, one of the people who presented in the Autismetics uh, Network uh, 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 context, uh, who are really talking about the social construction of autism and how actually uh, we need to put in focus uh, the fact that uh, people want to wage war on autism, mainly be waging war on people who have a divergent attitude. I won't read again the quote in the middle, uh, but it is interesting that a uh, philosopher of science, uh, Ian Hacking, exactly here came to kind of a, a problem uh, for himself because he wanted to pull apart reality, uh, carving nature at the joints and social construction uh, as two different things. But then when he uh, inadvertently spoke of it being both a reality and a social construction, what he found is that people were very enthusiastic of, of, about it being uh, both, a little bit in line with what uh, uh, Robert said. And actually, that is something that I will try to develop uh, later on in the talk. So coming back to the catch-22 of autism, I think uh, for me, and this was when I uh, was diagnosed, it really is something where, uh, which comes out in the actual fact, pragmatically, uh, where autistics are confronted with, which is the actual uh, uh, definition of autism as autism spectrum disorder in the DSM-5. And you see, there is on the one hand a behavioral de definition, so diagnosis of autism is a behavioral diagnosis. At the same time, there is a clause uh, that is uh, linking it to an innate learning uh, disorder, so somehow assuming that it is there from uh, birth. But crucially, the thing which uh, keeps everything together for the moment is this idea of dysfunction, problematic functioning. So there is to be some kind of disordered aspect uh, to autism. And that is actually what creates the dilemma if you look at uh, positive identification uh, with autism. On the one hand, if you say I'm autistic, you're supposed to be disordered. But if you think, if you say there's nothing wrong with me, I'm actually doing uh, quite well, as many of us or most of us are doing most of the time, uh, given uh, conducive circumstances, then somehow you're not autistic and a lot of people, uh, not only myself, get that kind of uh, uh, feedback that you're not autistic enough or if you're autistic then everybody is autistic and so on and so forth. So there is kind of a, a catch-22 there uh, based on that definition of autism which is a psychiatric uh, or DSM-5 definition of uh, autism. So. What I want to uh, go to is uh, uh, actually make a, an analog with uh, uh, hard uh, exact science, which is quantum physics. What I want to uh, say is that uh, somehow in the scientific uh, focus of uh, what is autism, the question what is autism, people try to explain either there is something natural, uh, particle aspect of autism, or there is something linking behavior to behavior. I think what uh, Jana talked about uh, of uh, the Gallagherian view, the view of uh, Sean Gallagher, actually kind of links certain behaviors, maybe an upbringing or whatever, 
uh, with uh, there coming out other types of uh, behaviors. And I think the catch-22 of autism research linked to the catch-22 of the diagnosis is that it cannot capture something which uh, is also at the heart of uh, quantum physics, that there is something indeterminate. If you really try to understand the autistic lift experience, you cannot just explain it. As I will tell later, there is need for explanation, but really the first thing you have to do is to try to understand uh, the autistic lift experience. Because as the uh, scales uh, uh, say here, if you would pinpoint the behavior uh, or the position of a particle, the behavior of somebody, uh, of, of some person completely, then you don't know specifically uh, what kind of uh, brain has caused that and vice versa. And I think both of these notions, the natural element uh, and the behavioral element of autism are important. But what is missed uh, and what creates the catch-22 is that people do not look at the lived experience of uh, autistic people and how they cope and compensate for uh, circumstances and how they try to behave in ways that uh, basically either uh, allow other people to uh, see them as functional or basically to balance their own lives in such a way that they can make a good balance between their talents and their uh, weaknesses. So for me, what this brings me or brought me to the idea of maybe to go beyond uh, the catch-22, we have to do something really at uh, the heart of uh, what is currently viewed uh, publicly at least as autism. And we have to uh, basically uh, listen to the experience as a lot of people are doing. I have here again the book of uh, uh, Christine. And that is one book of uh, many books, obviously. It is a book that actually lets autistic people speak out and say, okay, how do they experience life after diagnosis and so on and so forth. And I think if you do that, uh, and this is, uh, there is all the research which uh, goes to that, then this binary choice between being autistic and then in the dysfunctional psychiatric category or uh, being yourself, maybe with some quirks or whatever, uh, is something that people feel, also parents in this case, feel is very important in this dilemma. This is actually a real dilemma that is felt. Uh, why some parents, for instance, decide not to have their kids uh, diagnosed or to pursue a diagnosis and so on and so forth. So I think the solution, my proposed solution, it won't be that simple, but uh, in general, my uh, proposed solution is to go to the, uh, the view that there is not, no such thing as an autism spectrum disorder or an autism disorder or an autism which is inherently linked to dysfunction, but there is something like an autism related disorder. So there is something like autism and that autism uh, gets people into dysfunction some of the time given uh, the way uh, society uh, is at a certain point on time. I think this is important as a way to break open the idea that you can be autistic without ever being problematic or being deemed problematic or whatever. Uh, and this can also still keep together the autistic community and not, let's say, create, that was one of the alternatives that Robert uh, rightly uh, refused, create some kind of autism with where the strengths are uh, higher and, and other autism. No, I think this can admit to the fact that people with autism tend to get uh, into uh, issues which in the end propel them to get uh, some kind of, or seek some kind of diagnosis or do some identification with uh, autism. Uh, and I think the most important thing uh, for me maybe is the next to last uh, bullet on this slide. This also uh, brings us with the frame in ma of mind where we focus on the prevention of the problems which are commonly associated with autism instead of on treatment of deficits or uh, making people better or different or whatever. And I think going through my life history, this has been 
from the beginning very uh, important. I'm proud to be autistic. I have uh, no problem in that. But I do I had, I, I did have serious problems in my life, which also caused problems for my loved ones. And my only motivation when researching autism, and I actually also when researching uh, Tourette's, <coughs> is that I don't want people to be different. I don't want to be, them to be less autistic or less Tourette's, but I do want uh, to do some research that pragmatically allows them to own up to who they are and what they are and what they want to be and so on and so forth, without having, uh, without occurring, without incurring those problems with uh, where both themselves and their environment can to some extent uh, adapt to their specificities without creating some kind of uh, uh, issue. And I think I have here uh, a, a very interesting paper by Nomi Arpali, which is not specifically on autism, but I think this is something which uh, is actually very important that uh, at least for mental disorders, we have to uh, allow some kind of moral imagination, as she says it, and we have to allow for the individual, even if it looks very strange, for the individual to actually uh, have reasons for acting the way uh, they act, but also have some freedom in not acting a, a certain way, instead of just saying, bon, you're autistic and therefore you cannot do that or whatever, bon, it's much more nuanced uh, to that than that. So, given that I am uh, an, uh, uh, well, a neuroscientist as well, if, if you will, uh, I then uh, come obviously into the uh, issue, which is one of the issues that maybe Robert uh, wants to uh, avoid or doesn't uh, agree with, but the issue of how to define autism independently uh, from the diagnosis of dysfunction of, or of disorder. And I turn then to something which I won't uh, explain in detail, the left hand uh, of the slide I leave you uh, to figure out. And I come to uh, a view in the cognitive scientist, scientist sciences, which is uh, known as predictive coding. And predictive coding, and I won't go into any of the detail, but basically it says what is on the right hand side of this uh, picture. And basically it says that perception actually is uh, uh, a kind of mediation between an anticipation or a prediction that you have built up during uh, your life's history and whatever uh, is on the outside world. So you don't just uh, see what is outside, but you see something that you think might be outside. So going to the next slide, I don't know how many people, I don't have time to make a poll or something like that, but I don't know how many people have figured out what the uh, black and white uh, dotty image on the left is. But uh, as you can see here, it is uh, a frog. And I don't know how many of you had figured that out because I didn't figure it out the first time, but once you have seen it, uh, then it is impossible uh, or almost impossible to uh, unsee it. And basically that means that uh, whatever uh, you, uh, uh, you see, for instance, on the left-hand side of this uh, the black and white image, is not just out there in, uh, in the world, uh, just not sensory uh, information, but it is also, sorry, my screen moved, uh, but it is also something which uh, has to do with the expectation you have. And then the theory, uh, which uh, Sander uh, van der Kruis has uh, developed, is that autism act actually uh, is, and we will come back to that, is uh, an atypical uh, precision uh, of uh, your expectation. So you can go to the world with a certain expectation of uh, seeing something. And if your expectation is a very precise expectation with respect to quote unquote typical people, then you are much closer uh, to, you're, you're much more attuned to what is coming in, in from the outside than what maybe is your pre-given uh, kind of uh, history uh, about it. So, and again, without going into uh, too much uh, detail, 
This is something, and in this paper, which uh, I uh, helped uh, write, uh, of Constant, of Axel Constant uh, and others. Uh, if you take that kind of view, you can see that a certain kind of probabilistic link between uh, brain and behavior uh, comes out. And the word ecological was mentioned by Robert, the word scaffolding was mentioned uh, by uh, Jana. And that, I think, are two uh, crucial words to link uh, the idea of uh, brain and behavior without mapping them, without reducing one uh, to the other. On the right hand side, it's a little bit uh, crude. I took it from uh, another uh, paper, but uh, I would uh, make it more nuanced myself. But this, for instance, this type of uh, probabilistic link could explain uh, why uh, there is such a thing in the uh, DSM-5 as, as autistic repetitive uh, behavior. Because if uh, uh, people with autism uh, are atypically precise, then the world will basically have much more triggers uh, for them uh, and therefore, if those triggers are associated to some level of uh, cognitive uh, stress, then it is logical that people who are that precise or who perceive that precisely uh, will want to organize or control their environment in such a way that they have less cognitive stress. And this, in the end, boils down to things which I do and which certainly others do as well, uh, organizing the way that uh, uh, rooms are uh, organized in such a way that it's very predictable. Uh, and this gives a certain sense of uh, ease and also trying to avoid situations which are highly unpredictable or uncertain, where there are lots of uh, stimuli or triggers which you cannot immediately uh, make sense uh, of. So basically, what I'm uh, trying to say here very rapidly uh, is that if you look at uh, uh, autism in this way, with this kind of a view of uh, cognitive sciences or brain sciences, there is a way in which you could say that there is something specific uh, to autistic uh, brains uh, that does not immediately or necessarily lead to this type of complex behavior or that type of complex behavior, but that you can see that if that certain thing, uh, certain commonality is there, that there would be a tendency, a certain type of pressure for autistic uh, people uh, to enjoy uh, maybe stimming or to enjoy uh, predictable environments and so on and so forth, or to abhor uh, environments which have uh, too many uh, triggers. So, if that is the case, uh, I have in my original uh, drawing, I may have a solution, uh, a neuro solution for explaining what kind of thing uh, autism is. It might be, uh, like Sander proposed, this atypical precision which is uh, in uh, uh, at, uh, at the foundation of, uh, of autism. But I did not have, by that token, I do not yet have a solution for the right hand side uh, of the image. Why this human diversity, or even uh, as uh, Robert said, why diversity at all? What, what is the, why, why do we need to understand that? Why can't we just uh, limit ourselves uh, to saying, okay, bon, there are people with this type of brain and then we make sure that everybody has the right kind of brain and we can all live happily uh, ever after. So obviously uh, this nature, this explanation uh, in, in, in Hippia does not solve the problem that I uh, set out uh, to solve. So let's come to the other side uh, and look at if we have if autism is a specific type of embodiment, autistic embodiment, a typical body world coupling. Because remember, if we uh, go to this type of uh, drawing, then this is intrinsically a relational uh, type of model because it is not here just 
an individual and that's it. No, it's an individual together with expectations that have grown uh, through the individual's history and the relation of those uh, expectations with the actual sensory uh, input or, or things which are uh, out there. So uh, let's come to embodiment. Uh, and then uh, I knew a little bit about Jana's work, so it's not a total co coincidence. And it's much cruder than what uh, Jana has told uh, us or explained to us. But then one way uh, to look at uh, a different type of embodiment would be what I fear called an activism one. And you could say, well, there is a different type of body. See the highlighted sentence in this quote, that if you have this type of atypical body, that is a disturbance that necessarily leads to a disturbance of intersubjectivity. And these are, uh, uh, I'm not saying that Thomas Fuchs is fully in line with that, but this quote is in line with that. But there have been lots of uh, theories where, uh, for instance, the one uh, which is not an activist theory uh, of Peter Hobson, it's a psychoanalytical theory or developmental theory, which say, okay, there are autistic bodies and there are other bodies. Uh, there can be many reasons why autistic bodies uh, are, there can be many underlying uh, ways that autistic bodies are different. Uh, but basically, if you have such a body, then you are very different. And there is a way that uh, uh, you cannot have the same type of experiences as typical bodies or so on and so forth. And not uh, coincidentally, uh, Peter Hobson will say, bon, autism, you see that more with deaf people and blind people and people in an orphanage and so on and so forth. So he's not saying there is no bodily difference, but he's saying actually the important link is uh, between uh, the type of uh, cradling or, or, or upbringing and then later on not being able to attach to people uh, in the uh, same way as normal. And then just like Jana uh, did, uh, this is another view I didn't know about uh, uh, scaffolding, Maiese and Kruger uh, view, uh, which probably is more congenial to what I will uh, be saying. But if you look uh, at uh, in the Hannah de Jager view, you see in the idea of participatory sense making something uh, rather uh, different. Uh, in a way of looking at this. And this is my picture where two people are working together, which is actually a classical phenomenological uh, experiment uh, of using a saw together and synchronizing your action uh, because it's not, I mean, it's not just, you're not sawing because one is a good saw and the other is just there. No, you have to uh, make sense of that activity together. And in Hannah's words, then you, by interacting, you actually make new dimensions of new domains of sense making. So actually there is something in the sense making which is over and above uh, the, uh, the autistic uh, or, or, the embodied, or, or the embodied uh, difference. So, or in other words, whatever the embodied difference is, there is a way to go beyond uh, the embodied difference. And as I say here, and this is, I think, uh, crucial. Maybe I have to end there given time, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm trying to make a link here between something I think we all know, and that is falling out of sync or getting back to the flow. These are very human experiences. And what I'm uh, trying to propose here is that uh, instead of looking at autistic embodiment as something uh, very different or qualitatively or categorically different, we can see it as in line uh, with uh, 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 human experience. I'll skip this slide uh, and immediately go to kind of an analogy, which maybe some people find uh, too crude, but this is basically uh, where I think uh, we can also look uh, at autism. So clearly, if you are deaf uh, or you're deafened, there is something similar in the experience. But that does not mean that deaf, that being deaf and being deafened is the same. No, what is different is the history uh, of a deaf person, obviously, is a very different history 
as of somebody who acquired deafness either uh, permanently or temporarily. But still, if we try to understand people uh, who are deaf, we have the resource of looking at what happens if we are deaf. And there is some kind of a misattunement there, which is a misattunement that everybody can uh, certainly uh, uh, get to. And that's where uh, I think the solution or my solution of neurogradualism uh, would be positioned. I'm saying that uh, the, uh, the, the, the experience of precision uh, misattunement is something that we all share. Sometimes uh, it gets too much uh, for all of us. There are too many light, lights flickering and I don't know what. If we are stressed, I think the difference between uh, that and autistic uh, experience is not in the individual experience, but is in the fact that there is a history of misattunement specifically, uh, like with all neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental disorders, a history where from the very young uh, you are already, uh, let's say, incurring issues uh, uh, on that side. But at least then you can explain uh, the process and instead of just saying, and, and then it is not a matter of just saying behavior and biomarkers or brain markers uh, will coincide, but then it becomes something where you actually can see that there is uh, a bridge that can be made, but uh, a bridge between behavior and, and, and nature. But it is using an understanding that we all can have of episodes where we have some kind of uh, misattunement or desynchronization. I'm looking at uh, time and uh, I will have to uh, skip uh, a couple of slides, uh, but uh, I think this is something which is uh, uh, congenial uh, to at least one way of interpreting what uh, Robert said. If we say well, there is something like atypical precision, there will be some kind of a Gaussian curve and that Gaussian curve will not say these ones are definitely uh, autistic or not. It will depend on both where you are as an individual, but also where the, uh, the environment is, how uh, specifically, uh, how, how ableist uh, your environment is and how much it stresses. So, I can be in a totally different, uh, I could have been born in a totally different society, which was much less forgiving. I'm a very lucky person because I had a very forgiving environment in which I was uh, uh, born. But if I would be born in another environment, I would maybe have incurred issues earlier. Maybe I would not have been able to get uh, academic degrees and whatever. And this is, I think, uh, what uh, for me is important in neurogradualism, that it is something that allows to see autism as something which is uh, a dynamic process uh, uh, instead of as a static difference. So in this way, uh, I hope, uh, and this is my uh, conclusion, that at least I can show a way in which cognitive scientists can look at uh, uh, explaining uh, the neuro in neurodiversity, but at the same time, in the spirit of what uh, Robert said, that we also can keep a firm focus on the fact that these differences uh, actually are things which we can understand and which we actually also take for granted uh, most of the time uh, in, with artists and whatever, that these are the, the actually are these differences which make uh, 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 a group uh, more enjoyable to be in or more productive or more creative and so on and so forth. So in this sense, I certainly do not think, and that will be my last comment, uh, I do not think that uh, this explanation will ever be finished uh, because that I think is uh, the promise uh, for me of neurodiversity is that every time uh, we get faced with some kind of a diversity, if we try to understand them, we need to some extent to explain it, just like if a deaf person or a blind person, they would want to try to explain uh, why they are the way they are, 
by reference to experiences that we all have. So I think that uh, neurodiversity actually is a way of trying to understand more and more people to uh, make society, for me this is, a, is, is an ethical call linked to a scientific uh, call, that uh, we can make uh, the society, society more and more inclusive of diversity by, an, by really explaining why certain people uh, have difficulty uh, functioning within a certain uh, society.